Welcome to Money Making Conversations. I am your host, Rashawn McDonald. I say this every episode. It's time you stop reading other people's success stories and start writing your own. I always tell people when you talk about gifts and you talk about passion, well, lead with your gifts. And don't let your age, friends, family, or coworkers stop you from planning or living your dreams. My interviews that I do on Money Making Conversations are with celebrities, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and people I like to call industry decision makers. My next gift is Chef Q. Chef Q is a veteran that served eight years in the Navy. He is a great example of perseverance and not giving up on your dreams. He opened Q 1227, which is his month and date of his birthday, that's a restaurant in December 2019, and had to close four months later due to the pandemic. Chef Q made adjustments and created a to-go orders and a family menu, menu which became a big help for parents working home remotely. He also had working at home, working remotely at home. Let me say it like that. He has received exceptional reviews for his great tasting food and service from President Bill Clinton, TV radio host my boy Steve Harvey, singer songwriter Sean Mendes, love his music, actor Danny Glover, comedian George Lopez, NBA player Chris Paul, Houston Astros manager Dusty Baker, and a host of others. They have all enjoyed the delectable meals of Chef Q. Let's find out why. Please welcome to Money Making Conversations, my man, Chef Q. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good, man. Thank you for the invite. This is awesome. Well, first of all, I had to, no, I had to just lay out the, the, the food carpet. I like to say the food, let everybody know who I'm talking to. You know what I'm saying? So tell us about, you know, you know because I read your bio, is that you, you're a self-taught chef. You know, you... Yes, you I am. Do- I started washing dishes and... um Kept working my way up the ladder, um, not being, you know, given that red carpet treatment, kind of had to do what you had to do and, uh, you know, keep keep working hard, head down, work hard. That's what now, my mom taught me. Now, you know, when, when I hear that term, you know, just, you know, started washing dishes now, you, you, okay, I, I'm going to tell you my little funny story. And I remember I was seven, okay. 16 years old, I worked at Burger King. They hired me to do the hamburgers. You know, all I do, but I didn't like that job. I worked my way up to the cash register. Every time the manager would come, he go, why are you not making burgers? Well, because I wanted to work the cash register. So, but, 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 so eventually he let me stay at the cash register. Now, you started washing dishes. How did you start, you know, being invited over to, you know, make food or participate in setting the food up in a sous chef? How did that work? Well, it, it started in the prep room, right? Because the guys would go out on their smoke breaks and they needed, you know, somebody to watch their station. Right. So I volunteered and I just picked up a knife one day and the chef at the time walked by, saw me with a knife and said, hey, hey, let me show you how to hold that knife. Oh, okay. So it started there. Well, you know, the interesting you say that because, man, you know, we, we can assume because, I, you know, we watch TV all the time, food networks and video. Yeah. They said the most watched videos on social media are food videos. That knife and how you use it. First of all, you should have a sharp knife. You know, don't yes. try. Yeah. <laughs> you won't be frustrated. <laughs> try to do something with a dull knife. Talk about that because we all know that, you know, you have steak knives. You have, you know, when I say steak knives, you have knives that you have with your kitchen and with your fork and that. Talk about the whole process of things that we take for granted, <laughs> Chef Q. That should not be taken granted, especially a sharp knife in your kitchen when you're trying to prepare food. You know, that, that's a great point because I, I learned at a young, 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 young in the culinary career that there's a right tool for the right job. So you have to understand that and able to use the tool that's supposed to be for the job. Mm-hmm. And it really is going to make your job a little less cumbersome. Um, sharp knives is important. I sharpen my knives all the time. So it's little things like that that will help you you know, do the task more efficiently. Because I see, you know, when I'm watching the pros, whether it's Bobby Flay or uh, on, on TV or any of the, uh, the prominent chefs that come on these foods, or uh, watch the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ch- uh, Chops shows. When they start chopping that, those knives coming in slain, those are sharp knives that they're using to really, really uh, chop, the, especially when you do it with veggies. Chopping it real quick and all those things. And so so that was your first lesson. Somebody saw you over there just handling a knife real long. When did right. you start moving in and saying, this is what I want to do? Because, you know, we always have different dreams and different aspirations. But when does it, when does it become a, a reality to you that this is something that you could do and you wanted to do? Well, when that same chef had a little faith in me, he looked at me and he said, hey, you, you, you're pretty good at this. This could be a career if you want it to be. Um, because in my mind, I was just working my way to get a little extra money, working my way through college. Um, 
And it, when he told me that, it kind of dawned on me. And then I started doing a little bit of research and asking more questions and, you know, writing down more things that he would say and kind of getting serious about it and saying that it's more than just flipping burgers because that was the, the misnomer to me. To be a cook means I got to flip burgers or I got to, you know, fry chicken for the rest of my life. Right. So that was a misnomer for me. So when I learned out that there was so much more to do in this career called culinary arts, then I got more interested in it. Yeah, because you can be, um, like I said, you can't be stereotyped about what a chef yes. does, you know. Yes. And there's nothing Indeed. negative. You have a chef. Like, I go to, I love Waffle House. You have a chef there, call out the ticket numbers. He remember everything. He make your food. Then you go right. to a high-end restaurant, or you can go to other restaurants where you can have different titles for different things. So that's, that's a respect. And also, I always tell people on my show is that if you're going to go into a field, learn what you're going into. And that's what you had to do because you had these stereotypes of what a chef was that were totally incorrect. Right. You, you know, and another thing, I, I think I want to add on to that because I think that we have a talent, but I think we have to have a knowledge of what we go into. Right. And I think that's two totally different things. Um, you know, so that chef saw in me a talent that I could do this for a profession, but I had to learn the knowledge of what it meant to do what he was asking me to do. So I think that's two totally different things. And if we can understand that um, and then I want it, you know, again, it was a long, long road. I don't want anyone to think it was easy. Um, I got turned down many jobs. <laughs> I got told no a lot, um, but I just kept at it. I kept at it. I kept at it. And then, um, you know, sooner or later you get that break, but you got to be ready for that break. You got to be able to perform and you got to be ready to, um, you know, you got to show up on time. That's the little thing, right? Right. You got to do what you do, what they ask you to do. That, those are the little things. So work the shifts that no one else wants to work. That was all me. Um, long hours. First one there, last one to leave. That was all me. But I wanted to prove and I, to myself first and then to those around me that I could do this. Well, that's, that's absolutely true. When you call, when, because being a chef or being a cook, you know, usually you're the only one. In other words, if you have a normal job and you're in administration or you're a secretary, you don't come to work or, or you're a salesman, then they can slide somebody in that can cover for you. If mm-hmm. you are the chef, <laughs> there is no covering, right, Chef Q? Right, right, right. When I take a day off, we close the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but now, now, let, let me, but, but, hey, we're working on that though. We're working on that. I got a great team that we're right. training, and we're working on that. But you know, but but you you don't want to give away all your secrets either, do you? You know, people can take your secrets and go someplace else with it, right? Well, hey, so here's my thing on that. If if they take it from me, then I just create more. Okay. So I'm I'm not really you know hot up, caught up on that. There's a recipe book. Mm-hmm. So everything we do in the restaurant, there's a recipe book. Mm-hmm. So all the cooks and all the you know people that work there. If they want to grab a page and steal it, so be it. You know, I think that, you know, that just leaves me more room to create more. So, you know, I'm not caught up on, oh, it's mine. It's the secret. Because you know what? I'm standing on the shoulders of someone. Right. You know, my mom, my grandmother, my aunties, you know, I'm standing on the shoulder of those TV shows that I watch as well. Mm -hmm. I'm standing on the shoulder of those books that I read when when I was coming through the ranks. So if someone wants to stand on my shoulders, so be it. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because when I was doing stand-up comedy, you know, there's always a fear of somebody stealing your joke. You know, now I, I would hear comments, man, somebody walking, oh, he'll steal your joke, he'll steal your joke. And I was I was like you. I say, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm this is all the jokes I'm going to write in my life. Right, and right. so I'm a 100 percent guy. I would always go up and give my best. And that's what you're saying there. You're not going to limit yourself because you fear of uh, fear the the, something you can't control. Because I, I, you can't control somebody right. coming in and figure out your recipe and take it someplace else. If that's all, if you only got one hamburger in your life, then you got a problem. <laughs> I don't think you're one hamburger man, Chef Q. <laughs> right, right, right. And then, you know, it just leaves you room to create. I, and, you know, that's the thing about food. It's ever changing. It's forever changing. And the, the um, melting part of food is endless. So it really is about the create, creative mind of the chef. So I don't get caught up on all of that, you know, and, you know, I'm asked a lot of times, you know, by younger chefs or younger cooks coming up through the ranks um, about helping them and all that. And I'm really, really game because I I wanted somebody to do that to me, especially as a black chef coming up. Right. I wanted to see me at those executive chef positions and I didn't. 
So I'm really, really, really um, mindful about, you know, you know, talking to the younger chefs or younger cooks, especially of color. You know, you do based in a suburb right outside of Sacramento, California. And now, like you said, early on in your life, you got a taste for the culinary uh, flair. Uh, now, then you spent eight years in the Navy. Was that was that after you started cooking or you had sampled a little, little cooking training? And then you went that, was to the Navy? Be- that was before. My military career was before I started cooking. OK. Um, but um, when I got out of the military is when, you know, I kind of got a little training in the military, if you will. Because when I changed over my jobs in the military, they sent me to what we call the galley. Right. And they made me cook a little bit there. Um, and again, there was no intention of me to be becoming a chef or work in this industry. <laughs> but when I got out of the military and I needed a job, I knew I could wash dishes. Mm-hmm. I knew that. Mm-hmm. So that's where it started. And then um, just, I don't know, the hand of God, the a few breaks here and there. And, um, you know, here we are. Well, I, th- I think that uh, it, it takes a certain amount of perseverance, a certain degree, a whole lot of humbleness to say, hey, and I always tell people, sometimes you have to, you know, it's not about the money, it's about the opportunity. That's how I saw when you talk about washing dishes. You know, you saw an opportunity, and that opportunity yeah. led to the conversation we're having on my show, Money Making Conversation. I'm speaking with Chef Q, he uh, opened a restaurant, 1227. That's the month and date of his birthday outside a small suburb in uh, Sacramento, California area in 2018. And then you, everything's feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, walk us through the steps. This is step of 2020. Well, you starting to see it go bad, but you're not admitting that this could really happen. Not now. God, come on now, God. You can't do me like this. Right, right. So, you know, it's everything we did at the inception of the restaurant was intentional. We intentionally opened December the 27th, like you said, on my birthday. Uh Because in the restaurant industry, I know that that is a slow season of restaurants. It's holiday season. New Year's resolution, nobody's coming out to eat. So in <laughs> no. my mind, that gives me that gives me time to get my legs under us, get our staff together, and make sure we get things right outside the public eye. Mm-hmm. So it was very intentional. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then, you know, um, <laughs> but the pandemic wasn't pandemic intentional, rated. though. Okay, um, <laughs> and uh, I don't think I don't I wasn't ready for it. I don't think nobody was ready for it. Mm-hmm. But I sat down with my wife, um, who is my general manager. Right. And I said, well, it's not only hit us or affected us, it's affected everyone. So how are we going to come through with it? And we did. We looked at other restaurants and we saw what they were doing. That just didn't work for us because we were so new. Nobody knew who we were. So the DoorDash and the Grubhub and all of that stuff, it didn't work for us. Mm. So we created, yeah, we downsized our menu, created a family style menu for you know, for the family that are, was around us. And we, you know, we put it on our social media. But on top of that, we started feeding the frontline health workers in the hospitals. We started giving them box lunches and, you know, sharing the love with them and saying thank you. Mm. Um, and that started becoming, I don't know, a buzz in the hospitals. Mm. And then people started ordering our family meals. And they started enjoying our family meals. And then it just kept escalating and going from there. And, um, you know, from that, when they was able, when we were able to open outside, people just kept coming and kept coming. And, you know, then, you know, we were fortunate enough to be, you know, supported by the black community. And then so they started supporting us. Um, and it just ballooned to, you know, a really, really busy, busy restaurant. Which I'm very grateful for. Well, tell us what exactly is a family meal, Chef Q. You've said it several times, and that that I just think about I, when I hear the word family and a meal, I hear large portions. Is it two meats and to meat and two veggies, a meat and two veggies and a bread? What is a family meal? So, so in in my mind, what I wanted to do is create something to where all the family had to do was just go home, open the box, put it on the table, and have a, a dinner meal have a family meal with their kids and all that stuff. Because, you know, remember, kids wasn't, the kids were at home, schools in at home, and Mm -hmm. parents just didn't have time. Mm -hmm. So we created this menu to where they could choose, you know, one or two uh, of uh, proteins, whether it's rotisserie chicken, fried chicken, um, meatloaf. um, We had a seafood platter. We had all of this stuff on there. 
and then they could choose potatoes, rice, collard greens, mac and cheese. So they kind of pieced together their own little meal, and we just put it together in a box and had it ready for them when they came. I'm telling you something, man. Little- what you just said is a family meal: mac and cheese, <laughs> potatoes, right? Come on now, that that's that food again. That's what they call hearty meals. <laughs> <laughs> And also, it, you know, just a light seasoned if you want to put a little salt and pepper on it, you know, and all yeah. those things. So it didn't take no, it, you know, who like they, like they say, what kid don't like mac and cheese? So you went in there. but Every, every kid. But but you know every something, kid. Chef Q, everybody can't do mac and cheese right, though. You know that, though. Everybody can't. Everybody can't. <laughs> but I'm from the South. Don't forget that. I'm from the South. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, because because I always talk about food. You now you now you coming down to my area. When you say from the south. I'm born in Houston, Texas. Right okay. now, my, my 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 headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. I come from a big family, not as big as yours. I come from six sisters, two brothers. Okay, and uh, okay. you come from a, a youngest of seventeen. And so I'm the middle child, I'm, you know, I'm four, four above me, four below me. You know, so so they said I was treated special because I was in the middle, but I don't believe that. Chef Q, I don't believe that. So, so what about in the South did you uh, did you venture, my friend? Man, I'm from a small town called Cross City, Florida, outside of Gainesville. I know exactly. Um, where and I'm is. the youngest, so mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I don't want to say I was treated fair, uh, uh, <laughs> with special treatment. I was bullied by my brothers, man. They, they, <laughs> they took me through. <laughs> I, I know the feeling, you know, because you know you're hey. the youngest. Because they always yeah. said, you know, they didn't have what you get. You know what I'm saying? No, the food not was at all. better. Not at all. The clothes um, was my better. Mom, my, my mom kept me close, so that's why. <laughs> you know, I got to learn the secret recipes because she kept me close. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's really interesting, man. When we talk about that that chef world, you know, like I, you know, I didn't really start. I, I was like. You, I, I used to watch my mom, but my mom was a traditionalist. She wouldn't let me come in the kitchen. My dad, no boy, come over here. Let them, let them girls. They supposed to be in the kitchen. No, that's a mentality back then. So I never, yes. wa- I could only watch. And so when I got in college, I used to always remember what she did, and I kind of like put it together. And then, and then, so I always a, was a natural cook. You know, I I can go in the I can go in the uh, kitchen and just start putting stuff together. You know, and things like that. So I get the impression that you are just a natural person with the culinary experience of watching your mom and being there, which has led to you have a year over 25 years because you self-taught, like I said earlier. Of that yes. process, what surprises the people the most about you, your skills, when you say tell them you're self-taught? I, I think it's the flavor compound that we put together. We have bold flavors, um, and then we have some unique flavors. Um, being from the South and then, you know, I'm not afraid to try different things. Um you know, back in that day, and, you know, and I'm like you, a big family, but right. you know, my mom, I didn't have a father in the home tell me to stay out of the kitchen. Right. So that my mom, she was like, well, come in here, boy, just sit down over there in that corner mm-hmm. to keep me out of trouble type thing. Right. Or <laughs> to keep my brothers from jumping on me or whatever, you know. Um, so it was more of that. Right. Um, but, um, you know, so, so you start asking questions for mom and, you know, it wasn't like she wrote everything down or she explained everything to the T. She gave her best knowledge of what she was doing, but it really was like by taste or by sight. And I don't know, I, don't, I can count on, on my hands how many times I saw mom use measuring cups or spoons and things like that. It was all tasting it, you know? Isn't so, it crazy? You know, I, I know. I, I deal with that, man. I, I, I Just watching your parents, just, just throw it in there. Just throw yes. it in there, dude. Just throw it in there. Yeah, just throw it in there. So, you know, you, you, you fast forward and then, um, you know, so now I'm in, in my career and I had the pleasure to travel the world mm-hmm. through the military. Mm-hmm. I traveled the world and I tasted some great foods in foreign countries. So now I come back to California and I'm really serious about this culinary thing. So um, I, I reached back to the South, my roots in the South, and then I reached all the way, you know, to the, my international travels. And I started playing with all of these different ingredients, if you will. Um, and then I'm here in California, which is a farm to fresh capita. So I got fresh produce and fresh products at my disposal. So it really is like, let's just try this and see how it works. Or this tastes great. Or this sounds good together. Let's, let's just play. And it really has been that for me and for my career. And I'm not afraid to fail. I'm not afraid to try a dish and, oh, that didn't work. Scratch that. 
Um, so I'm not afraid that at that at all or changing it up a little bit because, you know, um, in the South, we cooked a lot of things or my, my, my mom and them, they cooked a lot of things that wasn't exactly healthy for us. So can I take those ingredients or that that way, change it up just a little bit to make it a little bit more healthy for for our lives today? So I, I'm challenged with all that, but I take those challenges head on. And, and you know, to me, it's it's our culinary industry is ever changing. It's forever like just transforming. Um, it's that's the growth in our culinary industry for me. Is I want to stay true to the roots, right? Where the food comes from, but I want to make it. I want to modernize it. Thus, we kind of call our restaurant modern comfort food. Absolutely. Uh, Q1227, uh, located right outside of Sacramento, California. I'm talking to Chef Q. Chef, tell us about this restaurant. Tell us what, what inspired you to open a restaurant first, and then let's go to the menu and some of the discussion of what's on that menu and what really pops out from you. Because everybody knows there's certain things on the menu customers just ask for. They go, I got to right. have this. Right. Chef, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. But then all right. you, but, but you keep your whole menu because you got to have variety, and the different people like different things. So talk about what yeah. inspired you. I, I've told everybody why, you, why this name Q1227, but what inspired the concept of a modern comfort food restaurant? Well, first of all, what inspired me was I was, um, I was at my wit's end working in other high-end restaurants. Um, all my life, I worked in pretty, you know, white tablecloth restaurants, if you will. And um, it just got to a point to where, you know, I'm giving them, you know, 14, 15, 16 hours a day, six, seven days a week. And just feeling really unappreciated. And, that, you know, a lot of people get to that point. But when I got to that point, I was like, okay, it's really time for me. Either it's now or never. Um, I got to do this. Um, and we looked for a building. We looked all over the place. And when we found our current location, it really was, this fits what I want to do. And then we keep created, because, you know, we talked earlier about steps get stereotyped. I didn't want to be called a soul food chef. I didn't want to be called even a black chef, if you will. Right. I just want to be a great chef. Mm -hmm. um, so we found our building. And then what we did was we looked around at all the other restaurants around us. And we said, well, nobody's doing food like this. Now, so then that's when we created the menu. And then that's when I said, okay, if I pull a little bit of the South and a little bit of this farm right. freshness. Oh, my travels to Japan. Let me pull that in here and let me, let me do this and let me marry these two together. So the, the restaurant, the, the, the menu, I should say, just evolved around what wasn't in the area. And from my travels and from my experiences and from my childhood. So the menu just kept evolving until what it is now. And, and some of the favorites ideally is like the lobster bites. Like I, it fried lobster years ago when I was a caterer and I had this one client, he's a former major league baseball player. He's a really good friend of mine. Um, and uh, when I opened, when he heard I was going to open a restaurant, he goes, and you got to put those lobster things on there. <laughs> I said, no way. Uh -huh. I, I, you know, I was like, no, first of all, lobster is super expensive. Uh -huh. um, and I don't know if I could, you know, execute it. Right. It's, it's, it's more, we can have a great thing in mind to put on a restaurant on the, on a menu. But we got to be able to execute it. There's nothing like having something great, but you can't execute it and get it to the table to the guests. So mm -hmm. that's that's horrible. Mm -hmm. So I was like, nah, I can't execute it. I can't put them on. So then I had to figure out a way because he kept at me. So those lobster <laughs> bites are probably on 99% of our tables when guests come in. They got to have them. Other favorites, um, as my wife likes to say, the meatloaf. We bacon wrap our meatloaf, but she calls it a grown man meatloaf because <laughs> it's really nice and hearty. And it comes with our mashed potatoes um, and some mushroom gravy. It's really nice and hearty. It's really a good meatloaf. Is it, is it a brown gravy, gravy or tomato-based <laughs> gravy that you use there for the for your meatloaf? Is it a brown gravy or tomato-based gravy? Tomato-based gravy. Woo! Is it a little sweet? You got a little sweetness in it? No, man, no. It got a little spice in it. Oh, okay, okay. You know exactly what I was talking about. A lot of people, they, they put their little sugar in it, give a little no, sweet. Okay. No, I like no, that. You know, I, I took the sugar out, trying to keep a little bit on the healthy end. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now, you know, the, you, you said something earlier about not wanting to be record. There's two things that I always hear when I talk to African-American or black chefs. The word soul food, which I still don't know what that means, because I can go to restaurants and see the right. same same 
menu and I don't see the word soul tied to it. And then it's being discriminated because you're black because they just say you can only do a certain type of a uh, menu. So talk about that experience because you mentioned here, it a little bit. And I want to let people know that I don't care how talented you are. Sometimes it all comes down to the color of your skin, you know, what people think about you and how they can stereotype you. And what exactly is soul food, Chef Q? You know, you know what? That's, that's a great point because, you know, I have been stereotyped. Um, I have been stereotyped and, um, you know, it's not fun. It's not fun at all to be stereotyped. Um, hold on a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. What's Samantha talking about? Muting your screen. What's that? It's, it's somebody is speaking. I don't know who it is. It's iPad 2 or whoever that is on iPad. We just need you to mute. Who's iPad 2? I, I thought it was uh, one of a, a rep of Mr. Chef Q. No. So who? I don't know. We good here. Oh, we'll, we'll check that out. The way. Let's go back to the cause they, uh, only person I heard talking was you, Samantha. So I want to let you know that uh, you know what I heard talking. But thank you. Let's talk about that whole discrimination thing that we deal with. I dealt with it as a writer in Hollywood. You know, I, I, I did sitcoms like you know, uh, Sister Sister, Jamie Fox, The Parkers. But they always said that okay, that's a black sitcom. I could. They would never consider me for the Seinfelds or the home improvements and things like that. And it always annoyed me because we were doing the same thing and I had the same creative skills. Same thing happens in the restaurant business, especially when you're a chef. You know, the word soul, like I said, I kid you not, I'm a foodie. I go to different restaurants and I go, isn't this what they call soul food over here? But they go to a black restaurant, they're just pigeonholed. And sometimes we do overindulge with the Lord, with the sugar at these quote unquote soul food restaurants. But you're doing right. modern comfort food. And so you shouldn't yeah. be pigeonholed like that. Talk about that being a black chef. Especially opening up, we were pigeonholed and we were we were stereotype, right? Because a lot of my counterparts in the industry, you know, um, you know, they, they did say that, right? And I you have to fight a, you know, from being offended by it. Right. So I just wanted to prove them wrong. And, and I, I'll be 100 percent transparent with you. It really angered me to to kind of go there like. I'm a chef. I'm not I'm not not you. I mean, I, there's nothing I can do about being black. Right. So that, that's who I am. Mm -hmm. But I'm a chef and I'm in, I'm in this industry and I'm doing what you're doing. So either you're going to recognize me as your peer or just don't recognize me at all. Um, I've been called racial names. I've been I've been stereotyped in the industry. I've been given shifts that the white chefs don't want right. because I'm the black. Now I've been in management my entire life, but they've been high end restaurants. Now and I'll tell you something else. I've been I've interviewed for jobs that I've not gotten because I'm gonna use the word color of my skin. Mm -hmm. So I would I would I would interview for executive chef job. Mm -hmm. They would say, Well, we wanna hire you for a sous chef. And I would like be wide. The guy that you're, you know, eventually <laughs> looking at is less experienced than I am. Um, not only would they want to hire me for less a position, but give me less money right. than what the average is. Mm -hmm. So I, I would take the job. And then this last job, no lie. I applied for executive chef. Mm -hmm. They hired me for sous chef. Two months later, promoted me to CDC, which is Chef de Cuisine. And a month after that, promoted me to um, executive chef. So I'm the same guy that interviewed three months ago mm -hmm. with the same experience. Mm -hmm. It's just that I had to come in and prove myself. Mm -hmm. And then one of the chefs told me, one of the corporate chefs said, well, I didn't think you had what it took. So it's that sort of um, racism that I've had to counterpart in my career. Um, and it's sometimes it's, it's, it's sometimes it's blatant and it's in your face. Other times right. it's subtle. Um but all in all, man, my end game was I'm here to learn. I'm here to um, gather information mm -hmm. and I'm here to better my career. So it's not about you. Mm -hmm. and it's not about the race, the racism that you that you, you know, you put out. So when we opened our own restaurant, yeah, we were labeled all of that, man. And I couldn't let it get to me. Um, I, I just had to, you know, stay with it all through the pandemic, all through all of that. Um, we were labeled because we had a predominantly white area. I think it's probably about 95, 96% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. white out here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, but it was both ways, right? We had some 
black patrons wonder why we was out here right and why we wasn't you know why we wasn't in the hood right right you know yeah. so it worked both ways um and it, to me that's all educational right mm-hmm. it's a time for me to educate both races right. and when you walk into q1227 it really is about love mm-hmm. it's about love it's about diversity it's not about the color of your skin it's not about your political background it's really about love and diversity we want to love on you we want to love on you. That's our thing. So, yeah. Well, I love this interview, man. I, I really appreciate you, Chef Q. Well, really, man, I, I like I said, Dusty Baker, that's my boy. You know, we order his wine. My wife loves his wine. He gets it out of California. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a lot of names. Chris Paul, that's my boy. So, there's a lot of names. Steve yeah. Harvey, that's, you know, come on now. That's, yeah. I, I used know to him cater his TV show there in Hollywood, man. Come on now. So, he, I, I really he, understand he, what's going on, man, with you and your brand. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on Money Making Conversation and tell your story. It was an outstanding story to tell. Man, thank you for the invite, man. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you in the restaurant one of these days when you're up in this area. Oh, you will. Yo, I'm going to come by. I'm going to bring some of my friends, too. And I, I'm going to just tell you, this I am, Chef Q. I pay. I don't ask for no. I ask. I'll pay every time because that's part of the whole process of being an entrepreneur. Can't win if everybody coming in chopping for free, okay? So I'm going to pay. <laughs> I, I got you, by. man. I appreciate you so much. I love you, man. Stay strong. And I hey, enjoyed man. the yes, interview, sir. man. Yes, sir. I thank really you very did. much. Thank you. If you want to hear or see any of my interviews on Money Making Conversations, please go to moneymakingconversation.com. I'm Rashawn McDonald. I am your host.